Tonight we'll be operating under Governor Lee's Executive Order Number 16 slash 34, 51, and 60 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Executive Order 16 concerning electronic means, which is extended by Executive Order 34, Executive Order 51, and Executive Order 60, and shall remain in effect until 11:59 p.m. Central Daylight Time on October 28, 2020 which at that time it will expire in accordance with the executive order. Live access to the virtual meeting is made available through Charter Channel 193 or S Channel 3. During this period of time, all Farragut Citizen agenda forum comments and questions, along with a name and address, should be mailed to the comments at townoffarragut.org and should have been received by 12 p.m. the day of the uh, meeting to be included in the record of that meeting. All Farragut Board and Mayor and Alderman meetings will be public notice per Tennessee state law. They will also be recorded and can be reviewed later on Town of Farragut YouTube channel. And pursuant to the governor's executive order, all votes taken tonight will be by roll call vote. I'll now ask the town recorder to please take attendance. Roll call for a quorum. Alderman Burnett. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer here. Alderman Pinchock. Alderman Pinchock's here. Alderman Pavlin. Alderman Pavlin here. Mayor Williams. Mayor Williams here. Uh, okay. Uh, the record will ask that uh, all media please identify themselves that's on the line. Hi, this is Gabby with the Farragut Shopper. Okay. Thank Hi, you. This is Hi, this is Michelle Holland, head with uh, the Farragut Press. Okay, thank you. Any others? So, okay. Uh, approval agenda uh, tonight. Is there any amendments agenda? No, sir. Move okay. to approve. Okay, great. Second? I'll second it. Okay. I'll ask the town recorder to take a roll call vote, please. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Alderman Pinchuk. Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Alderman Pavlin. Alderman Pavlin, yes. Mayor Williams. Mayor Williams, yes. Let the record show October 22nd, 2020. Agenda has been approved. And okay, next will be approval of minutes. And I'll ask for a motion to approve the October 8th, 2020 minutes as presented. Move Alderman to approve. Meyer, move to approve. Oh. Second. Okay. Uh, I'll now ask the uh, for a roll call vote from town recorder, please. Alderman Pinchuk. Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Alderman Pavlin. Alderman Pavlin, yes. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Mayor Williams. Mayor Williams, yes. Um, records show that October 8th, 2020 minutes have been approved and will be recorded as official minutes of that meeting. Okay, report, and again, uh, I may sound like a broken record, but um, I urge everyone to stay with the physical distancing and the face covering when you're around with each other, particularly with the folks that's got pre-existing conditions as they seem to be the main ones that are, are in the most trouble with this virus. And uh, again, I'll also state that uh, we, the board mayor and aldermen, place a very high value on our great staff and our volunteer committee members is both our Farragut residents, and we are thankful that Governor Lee has extended his executive order for virtual meetings for everyone's safety. I'll now yield the floor to the Vice Mayor Pavlin for her report. I don't have a report. I'll just add on to uh, what Mayor Williams is stating. Yes, this is uh, we're seeing cases go up. Please, everyone, go get your flu shot. That's this is a good year to do it, so that you're not your season is not really complicated. So um, uh, stay healthy, please. Hey, thank you. Any other aldermen have anything to report? I'll move on to a full slate of agenda items tonight. On ordinances, we have four ordinances to review with public hearing tonight. Uh, all four of them will be on the second reading. We'll start out with ordinance 17, an ordinance to amend the Farragut Municipal Code, Appendix A, Zoning, Chapter 4, Section 24, 
special event permit to update the requirements and allow for food trucks for special events by homeowners associations. Uh, good evening, this is Mark Shipley. I'll uh, go over these uh, ordinances that I have for this evening. Um, this ordinance is originally it started out as um, an effort to provide for food trucks as an option in subdivisions if those were sponsored by a home sponsored by um, hosted by a homeowners association so one of the uh, amendments in this ordinance is to provide for that i think we have five that would be um, allowed per year um, and then also while we were at it um, i have updated other provisions uh, in this part of the zoning ordinance to reflect the town's new sign ordinance language and to really update the whole section as to how these type of permits have been applied for and um, administered um, over the years. So uh, when this was presented to the Planning Commission in September 17th, um, they did unanimously recommend approval of Ordinance 20-17, and it was also unanimously recommended for approval on first reading uh, on October 8th. Uh, there have been no changes to this ordinance since first reading and the staff recommends approval of ordinance 20-17 on sec on second reading move to approve meyer second i'm going to uh, read any, any uh, questions or comments there are none for this item okay none discussion uh, Ralph Lassmeyer Pavlin. Sorry, I have none. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, pass. Uh, Alderman Pinchot. Alderman Pinchot, I pass. Okay, I pass as well. With a motion and a second, I'll ask the town recorder for a roll call vote, please. Alderman Pavlin. Alderman Pavlin, yes. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Alderman Pinchock. Alderman Pinchock, yes. Mayor Williams. Mayor Williams, yes. Let the record show ordinance 20-17 has been approved on the second reading. The next will be ordinance 20-18, an ordinance to rezone the property at 1013 McFree Road from agriculture A to open space residential overlay, R1 OSR, 24.5. 885 acres, Rackley Engineering applicant. Yes, this property is uh, known as the Gibson Farm. Um, it's just south of the property that's immediately south of McPhee Park on the west side of McPhee Road. Uh, the request is to rezone this from agricultural to R1 open space residential. Um, that is consistent with the future land use map uh, for this part of the town. And um, this rezoning request was unanimously recommended for approval by the Planning Commission on September 17th and also um, by the Board of Mayor and Alderman uh, for under first reading uh, on October 8th. And there have been no changes to this ordinance since first reading. And the staff recommends approval of Ordinance 20-18 on second reading. Move to approve. Please. Okay. Alderman Meyer, second. Okay, uh, any resident questions or comments on this particular uh, item? No, sir. None. And we'll move on to discussion and we'll start out with Alderman Pinchot. I'll pass. Okay, Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, pass. I'll pass. Okay, I'll uh, pass as well. I want to thank uh, all the citizens who took part, took part in the public outreach by the Comprehensive Land Use Steering Committee on, on the discussion of the South McPhee Road Corridor. Your input was very helpful in, in, in the zoning discussions for this area. Um, that's all I have. And with a um, motion and a second, I'll ask the town recorder to please take a roll call vote. Alder Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Alderman Pinchock. Alderman Pinchock, yes. Alderman Pavlin. 
Hold on, Pablo. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought I was unmuted. Yes. Mayor Williams. Yes. Let the record show that the ordinance 20 18 has been approved on the second reading. Okay, next will be a, a ordinance 2020, an ordinance to amend the text of the comprehensive land use plan update as it relates to the mixed use land use descriptions. Uh, yes, um, this uh, at the first reading, the staff had given you some background on uh, how we got to this point. But basically, this uh, ordinance is uh, an amendment to the text portion of the mixed use town center land use description portion of our comprehensive land use plan update that was adopted in 2012. Um, specifically, this language um, provides for some more succinctly stated provisions. There's some language in there currently that is a little more detailed than it probably needs to be, like talking about hours of operations and targeting certain um, um, types of businesses like art galleries and things like that. Um, the the uh, revised language also emphasizes the uh, interconnectedness, the importance of interconnectedness, iconic architecture, uh, focusing on form, arrangement of buildings, the context, the surrounding plan of development, um, and most specifically um, deals with residential types and densities to try to provide for um, more clear language uh, that, that um, you know, those, those type of developments are to be appropriate to the context. Uh, for example, high density residential with the language as proposed here would only be appropriate where it's part of a mixed use town center. Uh, it's there adjacent to it or within it to um, help it, you know, sustain itself. Uh, and also in those areas that do not abut existing residential communities. Um, and what this does is really it, it helps bring the language in this portion of the land use plan in line with some other provisions that are talked about in the plan, like transitions and flex density, uh, trying to blend it all together. Uh, because it, the plan in its current language does talk about protecting existing neighborhoods from incompatible new development, but this language, you know, substantiates that and um, really makes it much more clear than what we currently have. Uh, this language clearly provides for greater protection uh, to existing residential communities that um, directly abut the mixed use town center land use area. Um, when this was reviewed on first reading, um, there was a recommendation that was made under the uses section uh, to insert the words mixed use before the words town center in bullet items five and six. Uh, that amendment has been made uh, to the ordinance that was in your packets. Um, there have been no other changes uh, to this ordinance. It was unanimously recommended for approval uh, by the Planning Commission in September and also on first reading um, by the Board of Merit Alderman um, two weeks ago. And the staff recommends approval of Ordinance 20-20 uh, on second reading. Alderman Meyer, I'll move to approve. I'll second. Okay, with the first and the second, I wanna I'll make a statement to begin with, uh, and then we'll move on to uh, possible citizens forums uh, on this particular subject matter. Uh, I first want to say thank you to all the questions that were emailed to me from the Farragut citizens. Uh, I'm still working on the list to uh, to reply. And uh, but uh, what I have to say is really the correct information is the foundation for the best opinion here. Uh, I'd also like for everyone to understand that the proposed second reading tonight is to protect existing residential areas. This concerns all areas where their homes could be potentially be right up against high density residential, uh, be existing vacant property or be torn down and, and repurposed in the future. And uh, at this point, I'll go ahead and uh, ask the uh, town recorder to read in the citizens comments, please. Yes, sir. Our first one is from Phyllis Lent. She's 
at 12423 Comblain. <clears throat> says, why in the heck is the multi-residential area so close to a school? Traffic is already awful and students are in danger of cars and perhaps ones living in the housing. This plan needs to be redone. Developers probably don't live in the area, not in my backyard. The next one is Celeste Lee at 216 Town Road. I received an email from Louise Pavlin with the question, do you want the substantial residential use throughout the MUTCD to be primarily multifamily residents? My answer is no. I do not want multifamily residents as a part of our town center district. The next one is Carlton Edmonds at 308 Park Place Boulevard. So that says I live at 308 Park Place Boulevard and the subdivision directly behind Town Hall. I've served on the HOA Board of Directors in the past, but I'm currently not on the board. We are directly impacted by any changes to the use classification of the MUTC. As a, re as a resident, I'm not opposed to changing the use classification away from substantial residential use, but I would like to see it, it against high density housing, which has been previously proposed for this area. Our concern is access and egress from Park Place, which is already difficult at times. High density proposed for the former Kroger Center to the east and for the mayor's property adjacent to Park Place would put us in a, a competition for access to Campbell Station Road and Kingston Pike. Interest interestingly, access to the town hall during this year's early voting has been severely impacted since demand has been heavier than I have ever seen. Overflow parking on the street has extended up into our subdivision, making it very difficult to access um, by emergency responders. <clears throat> Some of the problem is, be, is because voters don't realize how little room is left for travel and not being considered enough to yield to those with the right of way through trying to exit the subdivision. High density housing, more attractions, and not enough parking space would only make this a permanent problem for us as residents. Next one is Ben and Susie Parham at 11008 Callaway, Drive, Callaway View Drive. Board of Mayor and Aldermen, I respectfully request that you remove the substantial re residential use current text wording from the current language in the mixed use town center land use. I want a town center, I believe the majority of the town residents likely do too. However, I do not want the town center if it includes 208 unit apartment complex that will be four stories high. I was under the impression the town of Farragut had strict regulations with regarding how high a building could be and the signage and occupancy. This is why we chose Farragut, not any other area of the city with equal or better schools and property values. I'm an educator and feel as though this would put, a, put our Farragut schools at a great disadvantage as they are already overcrowded and un underfunded compared to the rest of the county. In addition, the additional traffic this would cause in the middle of the most congested intersections in our area would be a major negative impact. I realize the old Kroger is an eyesore in our community, but there are better uses that a 280 unit apartment complex. I encourage you to approve the town center concept and remove the substantial residential use wording. I respectfully ask that you please represent the majority of the voters' interest rather than a builder or construction company who probably do not live or work in our beautiful Farragut community. The following is the existing language of the mixed use town center land use description that applies to all the properties in the M MUTC overlay, the purple portion. The substantial residential use, primarily multifamily residents, but some attached units, townhouses and duplexes, for transitions to adjacent single family neighborhoods. Page 26 of the CLUP, second bullet point under the category entitled uses. Again, I would respectfully request the Board of Mayor and Alderman consider the current, consider the current text amendment to remove from the existing language concerning substantial residential use, primary multifamily, while maintaining the intent and goals that to provide for the walkable pedestrian oriented town center. <clears throat> the next one is James and Carol Taylor at 11108 Windward Drive. We concur to remove from the existing language substantial residential use of multifamily residents while maintaining a walkable pedestrian oriented town center. Thank you for consideration of our prior object objections. Next one is Tiffany Gundry and Matt Van Essen, both Park Place residents at 244 Ivy Gate Lane. It says, to the members of the board, as residents of Park Place neighborhood, we support the proposed amendment, the current comprehensive land use plan to reflect the following verbiage. 
High density residential can only be in a mixed use center currently going in behind the old Kroger building and has to transition to what it abuts. High density residential apartments with not only negatively affect impact property values, the immediate surrounding areas, but it would also tax the roads and schools of the impacted area. Kingston Park is already heavily trafficked and congested. Fairgate schools handle a huge number of students and traffic from Fairgate residents. The proposed amendment regarding transition from new high density residents to the type of neighborhood and residents that abuts will only will allow new structures to become part of the town of Fairgate without overwhelming current neighborhoods and resources. Thank you. The next one is Michael Wilson at 412 Eisenhower. His states, good evening. My issue with these amendments is a lack of significant public outreach to check the current attitude of the citizens as required on page six of the comprehensive land use plan. I understand the position the town is taking and believe if the outreach is conducted, many if not most citizens would support something similar to what is being proposed. Many simply want to have their voices heard and, the, and provide input on these changes. Admittedly, there are conflicting opinions regarding these amendments and if they constitute a major update. Town leadership, including many of you, have provided varying responses to this question. Mr. Mayor, in a personal email to me his, and his Fairgate Press article today states that the required public outreach has been done with little or no interest. Alderman Pinchock during the first reading stated this was a minor change that did not require said outreach. Alvin Meyer stated essentially the same in his Spirit Press article today. He said, here's my own address, restricting apartments from 100% of the town center land to 25% of the town center land is not a major change to the CLUP because the apartment restriction does not change land use, goals, or intent of the CLUP. Limiting the MUTC area of high density residential by 75% is contrary to strategy one. Bring about a downtown by limiting the substantial residential called, called for in paragraph E, as well as strategy three, encourage greater housing choices, encourage greater housing choices negatively impacted. Included in this strategy are support for new and expanded retail services and greater housing diversity needs for needs of young professionals and the elderly. The mixed use town center description intent and uses section further support the two strategies above. The intent section, item two states, integrity, integrated high density residential development to help support retail and other commercial uses. Under the uses section, item, item two states, substantial residential uses, primary multifamily residents, but some attached units, townhomes and duplexes for transitions to adjacent single family neighborhoods, emphasis added. It is apparent that the majority of residential properties should be multifamily with lower density residential next to existing neighborhoods. The proposed changes limit MUTC high density, multifamily residents by 75%. This is a large change with a substantial negative impact on the MUTC development of the CLUP strategies one and three. In the Brooklyn development site, key characteristics of the MUTC, such as high degree of ground floor transparency or glass for visual interest to pedestrians, and connected building facades, facades with made minor setback variations, will be changed too. These are, key, these are key to garnering a downtown feel in the town center. As an example, simple, simply compare the artist renderings for the Brooklyn development site CLUP page 53 to the developer provided renderings in agenda item number five from the FNPC meeting on July 16th, 2020. There are significant differences between what the plan shows and what is proposed to be developed with the substantial changes to the MUTC. The main argument during the first reading and reiterated in the mayor, mayor's Farragut Press article today is that it is being done to protect existing neighborhoods. As previously noted, this protection is currently provided through the proper transition of density, commercial and high density residential to transition to lower density residential. Additionally, the governing zoning districts for all multifamily residential development and the MUTC further protects residential properties by restricting building height 
within 100 feet of, of the peripheral property lines. Thus, the developer cannot place a three or four story apartment building within 100 feet of current residential property lines. As good as the reasoning of protecting existing neighborhoods sounds, it is a straw, straw arm, straw man argument that the FMPC and BOMA have a responsibility to protect these properties under the current requirements. Lastly, the vice mayor has stated that the town must treat all landowners fairly and equitably, regardless if they own one acre or 200. These amendments do just the opposite. The issue has come up due to the proposed development of the Biddle Farm. As noted in the August 29th FMPC meeting, item nine, the town asked to, the applicant to identify any provisions that they may wish to have revisited and amended. This request was made during the previous staff developer meeting. This input is specific to the planned commercial district. And that's our time at the five minutes for um, this one. I'll finish the sentence. This input is specific to the planned commercial development zone district, which would need to be modified to allow them to build apartments on the ground floor. Our next one is Christine DeMauro at 349 uh, Bernie Circle. As a homeowner in Fairgood, I'm strongly opposed to any changes to the CLUP, which will allow overbuilding in our town by developers who want to build high density rental apartments. Next one is Ron Roeck at 725 Foxdale Lane. The Biddle Farms proposed project is quite disheartening yet expected. Let the, let the heat from last year blow over and then strike. Sadly, the bid picture is now being ignored. One, as we calculate last year, there are multiple efforts to build apartments in Fairgate, including Biddle, over 800 in total. If Biddle gets approved, then the others have strong precedent to argue for their projects to be approved. Two, apartments locally owned sound good, but can we be assured that they will not stay that way? I read it by buying the complex and then continually buy and sell in a portfolio of other properties like we traded baseball cards as kids. This property will mean nothing to them, and often it will be bought and sold to offset taxes, gains, losses, and such. Thus, we know the upkeep will the upkeep will not matter to them at all. The citizens of the town will hence suffer. Three, pre-COVID and post-COVID, when the public schools could not hand, and cannot handle the increased volume, kids from Fairgate have to ride on the floor of the school buses. Is outrageous and dangerous. The library library being your, being removed to pack in more classrooms is ridiculous. So what if FH, FHS is not currently at capacity when FPS and FIS are over capacity? Four, Chetto's out of control growth and lack of infrastructure adds to Fairgate's growing problems with traffic and overcrowding schools. Hardin Valley's mismanagement of growth traffic infrastructure hurts Fairgate also. Sadly, Fairgate has to factor this in and do what is right for its residents. Five, as always, a town center sounds nice, but this isn't a town center. I saw proposed Aldi on the town center map with Kroger, Fresh Market, Ingalls, and Publix all in the extreme close proximity. We do not need an Aldi's there. Also, this is certainly not the time to be adding brick and mortar retail. Almost all other retail centers are struggling to get tenants. The newly revamped Ingalls Center has zero, has attracted zero, and what a great location it is with parking, traffic lights, et cetera. This will not be a town center, but it will be another mismanaged shopping center in the area of e-commerce and big box domination. Six, no way Campbell Station and Kingston Pike can handle more traffic. Recently constructed buildings up against roadways kill the opportunities to widen these roads now. Very poor planning. During different times of the day, Campbell Station going towards I-40 and up into Hardin Valley is also a nightmare. Simply, or number seven, this simply isn't the vision of Fairgut that we were sold. Sad times in Fairgut and kind of regards. Our next one is Mike Mitchell, 716 Brooksworth Boulevard. The Fairgut Comprehensive Land Use Plan states major updates should include substantial public outreach to help check that the plan reflects current attitudes. Major updates are also defined as one that substantially changes the land use goals and intent of the plan, CLUP page six. It is clear that these proposed changes on September 17th in the Fairgate Planning Commission about the text amendment to the CLUP were major and should have been discussed with the community just as the town did with the future land use plan updates for the Watt Road Corridor and Outlet Drive in recent years. The Fairgate Planning Commission ignored Fairgate Wall. 
and the planning commission, if the planning commission makes a mistake, it is up to the board of mayor and alderman to send back the issue to the planning commission. Not only has the BOMA failed to do that, it has voted once to approve this mistake and will vote a final time this evening. This is wrong. Not only is it wrong, this body has been notified repeatedly, it is wrong. In addition to that, there is an issue of conflicting agendas. This is the agenda for South Developer Tuesday, September 1st, 2020 FMPC item. The agenda listed item number eight, discussion on Fairgut land use plan and zoning related text amendments associated with the redevelopment of the old Kroger property, Town Center at Middle Farms, parcel 3.0203 and a portion of 3.18, portion of 3.19, tax map 143.45 acres. This is the agenda for the public Fairgate Municipal Planning Commission, September 17th. Item eight, discussion and public hearing on amendments to the text of the comprehensive land use plan updates as it relates to the mixed use town center and use description, town of Farragut applicant. The town of Farragut misrepresented the agenda to the Farragut residents, but was honest to the staff and developers. It was the same item. It was for the Biddle Farm. It was, this was unethical. It was a false and misleading defective public notice to the public. Mayor Williams wrote the Farragut Press this week that the people of Farragut did not respond to the opportunity to speak about the changes to the CLUP. When and where was such an invitation made to the public, made public to the people? The mayor also said that the Farragut Press, that the CLUP steering committee met the requirement for public outreach on the CLUP. How is this possible when no one knew about the steering committee? It is disappointed to see such tactics used to prevent people from, re, from redress of their town government, which is clear, which is a clear violation of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Isn't this a fool's errand? Half of the Biddle farm is under a 100-year 100 100 floodplain. You can see that clearly on the enclosed FEMA map. The BOMA and Planning Commission have lost faith and trust of the people for a piece of property that is not developable. Do the people have, their, uh, have to take their own cases over your heads and go to TDEC or the Corps of Engineers? All right, our next one is Mark O'Connell or O'Donnell at 11044 Crosswinds Drive. Says, Dear Boma, before asking questions, I'll reiterate that the current road network can't efficiently handle increased traffic resulting from any amount of new high density residential construction associated with the proposed town center. Question number one Why are you favoring the will of the developer of the will of the people? I don't understand, and I'm and I too assume this action is allowable through the concierge provision in the CLUP. Three. How will the construction of high density residential reduce traffic congestion in and around the area of Kingston Pike and Campbell Station? Four, will the developer construct a loop road or overpass of sorts to allow through traffic to circumvent the town center and feather back into existing main arteries? Five, has the developer provided a traffic study that corroborates that his design concept will actually reduce traffic congestion? Six, will the developer be on the hook to pay for necessary infrastructure upgrades resulting from the text amendments and zoning changes? He's requesting an order to build his development. Seven, is there enough space to gradually transition from high density MUTC to the, the established very low density neighborhoods located along Concord Road? Eight, I understand the concept of transition as outlined in the CLUP, but what are your thoughts on what a gradual transition would be for specific high, de high density MUTC to a very low density established neighborhoods along Concord Road. Nine, where is the attraction for the regional draw? 10, will the town center plaza house an amphitheater or, or be expanded to house an amphitheater that will attract KSO and the likes of artists to play at the Bijou to perform at Farragut? A couple of comments on the introduction of the CLUP. I did not realize the outlook of the town was so bleak. Two, I didn't realize the Parkside Mall was nearing the end of its lifespan and likely to verge of becoming passe. A couple of observ ob observations on the project as it relates to the CLUP. Three, is the project design concept as a whole expandable and lend itself to being future-proof? Four, does the four-story high-density residential building with a chain-link fence tennis Concrete courts meet the timeless aesthetic appeal, timeless aspect of architecture. Will it be built with granite foundations similar to downtown Knoxville? Five, will will the will there be technology 
technological advancements, and employees forms alternative energy, wind, solar, and geothermal that will reduce energy costs for residents. Six, when Fairgate High School students gaze upon the four-story high-density residential complex from the bay windows of the high school and the lunch court, all they aspire to begin their careers in downtown Farragut. Seven, this downtown will be so grand in nature, it will connect Farragut to outlying towns in downtown Knoxville. Eight, will the town center is rendered truly be a catalyst for pumping vitality throughout the community. Nine, will the high density residential complex be expandable to allow for a variety of rooftop activities as popularity grows? 10, do you really feel this development captures the essence of the CLUP? Next one is Dennis Falkowitz at 412 Torrington Court. The vice mayor has stated that all property landowners must be treated fairly and equally regardless if they own one acre or 100 acres. Isn't this amendment doing just the opposite? As noted in the August 29th FMPC meeting, Adam 9, the town hall asked the applicant to identify any possible provisions they may wish to have revisited and amended. This request was made at a previous staff developer meeting. This is, a specific, this is specific to the Plain Commercial Development District. It needs to be modified for them to be allowed to fit apartments on the first floor as opposed to above the commercial parts of the building. But when, this, when, but when changing this, wouldn't it then apply to all properties in the MUTC? Don Kendall in an email August 10th, 2020 states that the desired changes include removing residential, residential provided loca located in upper stories, requirements and changing the height, building height to 60 feet to allow for four story apartment buildings. So if the town changes or amends the zoning for this specific developer, but at the same time limits other MUTC property landowners abilities to go forward with similar projects, as currently described in the MUT MUTC land use and as in MUTC section of the C1 zoning, how will this be fair to others? How can we amend it for one particular developer, but not allow others to do the same opportunities? And won't this bring possibility of lawsuits? Well, I know that these issues have been in the paper and posted online with COVID and meetings happen virtually. I believe it has been hard for Fairgut citizens to be totally aware of what is happening. That being said, I would like to see this issue tabled until more thorough public outreach has been completed. Thank you for all you do for Fairgut. Mark and Cindy Lanzoni at 11017 Callaway View Drive. Hello, first we'd like to thank you for giving us the opportunity to share our desire with you. We have lived in Concord Hills for 13 years and love Fairgut. We wouldn't like to, we would like to see the wording changed and then the directive the directive changed to not substantial multi-use housing for future development. The next one is Doug Horn at 12103 South Foxton. It says, we object to the ordinance 2020 that amends the text of the land use plan as relates to the mixed use town center land use. This proposed change is arbitrary and it discriminates against Eddie and Linda Ford 68 acre property. The Ford property was always listed as the perfect mixed use town center opportunity property just west of the town hall. We are coming to the town with a fine mixed use town center proposal with frontage out lots, medical office and retail pod buildings, multifamily and attached um, condos. The current land use plan calls for multifamily up to 15 units per acre. And that's what our plan calls for. The Ford family has owned this property most of the 20th century and all of the 21st century, and for the town to change the rules arbitrarily, arbitrary for mixed use town center land use, is completely un unfair and ridiculous and appears to be targeted, targeted to deny the Ford property the land use that has been planned for years by the town itself. The town officials always wanted this property to be a mixed use town center with multifamily condos, medical office and retail structures. Of course, no matter the land use, we can propose zoning changes of the, third, of the 68 acre Ford property, but it's much easier with the current land use plan that has been in effect for years. To limit the mixed use town center development plan for high density residential to property located only in the area bounded by South Campbell Station Road, Concord Road and Kingston Pike is, is picking winners and losers and legally questionable and will subject the town to legal action. I'm forwarding this mixed use town center plan we call Agora, which means a gathering place named after the historic Greek civilization. This is 
what we are submitting submitting for Eddie and Linda Ford property. Please show this to the people in the BEMA meeting on October 22nd. Every development, including Concord Hills, Thornton Heights, and Glen Abbey, have folks that object to the adjacent development. We remember a few years ago when, when we built the Glen Abbey development, there were adjacent residents that objected to it. All growth and development have people that stay NIMBY. Please keep this in mind. Again, this is a quality mixed use town center development. We are proposing Agora. We do not believe it, it is wise or fair and equitable to make the text changed in ordinance 2020. Our next one is Christina Meyer at 412 North Cedar Bluff Road. Um, this is Mr. Horn's attorney. Says, as to follow up to my client's comments, I would like to add some additional concerns that the town of Fairgate needs to consider. As attorney for Doug Horn, a Fairgate resident and real estate developer, I have been involved several times over the last couple of years in aiding his rezoning request to install multifamily residential development on his own property. For these were formal requests to the Fairgate Planning Commission or informal inquiries made to the town's planning department. I've personally been in attendance at at least twice to hear him and his representatives be told that the town center district reflected in the land use plan is the only place the town would allow the density Mr. Horn needs in order to make such a development financially feasible, despite the fact that neither Mr. or Mrs. Horn nor any of Mr. Horn's companies own any property in the town center area. I've, I've been advised that the same refrain was re relayed to him and his employees on several other occasions as well. As a result, Mr. Horn lost two separate contracts with apartment developers to purchase the property he owns with his wife. Finally, Mr. Horn took the town up on its promise and he under, undertook the negotiation of a property belonging to Mr. and Mrs. Eddie Ford, which is in the heart of the Fairgate Town Center District. He relayed this information to the mayor and others so the town has been well aware of Mr. Horn's intention to bring mixed use development plan for the town center Zoning district and the commission for zoning approval, which plan would necessarily include multifamily housing. It also has every reason to expect the housing density within such a proposal will be great or equal to or greater than his previous petitions for zoning approval. I believe it strains credibility to assert that the planning commission's sudden desire to reduce density levels within the town center district, just as Mr. Horn is preparing to seek approval for high density housing within the town center is merely a coincidence. Rather, the announcement of the proposed changes to the land use plan smacks of an attempt by the commission to sidestep a potential zoning challenge by Mr. Horn based on the commission's manifest abuse of its zoning power when it turns down his proposal for rezoning consistent with the current land use plan. After all, if the plan is changed prior to his submission for housing density approval, then perhaps the commission's hands are clean. Mr. Horn's plans for a multifamily project on Mr. and Mrs. Ford's property will most likely be resident resistant by some adjacent property owners over years of increased traffic, diminished of property values of their home. However, as planning department staff and most or all of the commission members are surely aware, aware today, just as they were surely aware when the land use plan within the town center mixed use concept was adopted, generalized and common common fears of injury by neighbors wary of new development that do not confer standing on those neighbors to challenge rezoning that is based upon the land use plan. Accordingly, it is much more political ex extent to just change the plan before Mr. Horn's submission, despite the year-long mantra of the commission and the planning department that the town needs multifamily housing to attract younger residents the only place to have such housing is in the town center district zoning district. Now that someone has finally found an economical viable way to affect the town's desire, the planning commission has changed its mind. We hope the commission by, by extension, the town will reflect on all the potential implications of reducing the housing density within the town center district that is reflected in the land use plan. If it does, we believe the only conclusion that can be drawn is that the town center density requirements should not change just as the long desired concept of a mixed use development that attracts a younger demographic could actually be realized. Thank you for your time and attention. The next one is Glenn or Gerald Hammer at 11137 Windward Drive. So, dear Mayor Williams and Board of Aldermen, let me start by saying, as discussed in my previous letter to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen dated October 7, 2020, 
I have read the CLUP and all of it, including the proposed revision and informed on the pur purpose of Ordinance 2020. I'm generally in agreement with the development of the MUTC and would like us to spirit it to do something with the old Kroger I store on the middle property. There is potential for positive benefits if implemented correctly for the town and the people of Farragut. As such, I will address only the proposed language in Ordinance 2020. Thus, recommending we replace Bullet 5 under the Uses section, page 31 of 55, with the following wording. High density residential shall only be approved as part of the mixed use town center development plan located in the area bound by Camp South Campbell Station Road, Concord Road, and Kingston Pike. Delete bullet six. Thank you for your time and attention. I'm glad to discuss any of the above. Feel free to call or email me. And that concludes our citizen comments. Okay, thank you. We appreciate the uh, comments that's been sent in as always. And uh, at this point, uh, we will uh, we'll go into discussion from the board member. Uh, I think uh, we'll start with probably uh, Alderman Pinchock. All right, this is Alderman Pinchock. Um, I'll be brief. I just have a few things to say. Um, I have uh, been on the board for six years uh, since 2014. Uh, that's two years after the um, Comprehensive Land Use Plan was uh, created and uh, approved. Um, we have known for eight years now that a town center was going to need high density housing to make this project work. And uh, I think that this, and I hope that this ordinance will help us uh, with the way this high density is developed. And uh, that's that's about all I've got to say. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, move on to. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, um, we'd like to make a couple comments. The first comment is that my decision on this vote is not based on any plan um, by a developer. I have not seen Mr. Horn's plan, although it was submitted to us. I have a day job and I haven't looked at it. Um, I'm vaguely familiar with the other plan that most of the residents are, are talking about in their comments, but I don't have a very learned knowledge of it. The basis of my vote is the comprehensive land use plan itself and the strategies that are included in it. And I believe that this amendment meets strategy one, which is, as Alderman um, Pinchock has alluded to, has been um, uh, a vision for leaders in Farragut for at least eight years. And strategy one basically lies, outlines the vision of a downtown with people living in it, people shopping in it, offices, um, dining, and having substantial residence um, densities within that um, section of the town. And I believe that this amendment still meets that strategy. I think this amendment also guarantees the strategy number three in the CLUP, which increases housing choices. I don't know anybody on this board, I don't know any Farragut resident who wants six or seven apartment complexes in our town center. I know no one who wants that. And that's what we're going to get if we do not vote and to approve this amendment. This amendment will allow for different densities of residential throughout the entire town center. So we will still have a section, about 25% of the land will be designated for apartments, which is what the slang has been for um, our high density um, designations. But there are still other types of densities of residential uses throughout the entire town center. And for me, it makes good sense because the amendment makes good sense because it meets strategy three. We're guaranteeing that there will be multiple choices. There won't be 100% apartments across the board. It'll be apartments in 25% and then other density of housing throughout the rest of the, of the area. And so I, I fully support it. Um, I'm a proud um, standard barrier for the vision. I believe that we need a downtown with people living in it. I would be very concerned to have a downtown without people living in it because that downtown would be competing with Turkey Creek and we need to have a downtown that helps um, support the businesses that will be inside of it. And I think that this amendment will still allow for that. 
Um, I've heard, and you all have heard, multiple comments about traffic concerns, and I share those concerns, and I probably don't want to speak for everybody else on BOMA, but I'm thinking we all are concerned about traffic um, based on any development that happens in this town. My understanding is that we will have a study done before any formal plan is, uh, and final plan is presented to BOMA to review. And so um, I want to make sure that the residents and everyone hears me when I'm saying that my decision is not based on any kind of plan that has some kind of negative impact to tra on traffic because there has been no plan sent to BOMA for approval. And we won't approve any kind of development uh, we won't vote on any type of development without the data involved in a traffic study and most likely some kind of environmental study, which is really the job of the developer to do. So therefore, very long-winded, I apologize for the length of time. Um, I truly support um, this amendment. I believe it meets the heart and the vision of the downtown that we will have in the town of Farragut that will make us unique and will give us an iconic identity. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alderman Meyer. Uh, next will be uh, Vice Mayor Pavlin. I'm just going to make a really brief statement that I believe that this amendment protects existing residential while uh, providing for a pedestrian oriented town center. And with that, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. I thought we already did that. Okay. Uh, Didn't we have. Excuse, excuse me. I'm sorry, okay. I thought that we already made the motion to approve in a second, but I was responding to the vice mayor's comment, but maybe we didn't. Uh, we did. Uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, my plan was to read in what I had put in the newspaper, but I think everybody's probably seen that and read it. Uh, so uh, what I will say, planning our community is, is really vitally important. I mean, it, it really is. and. With high development standards, it's, it is an ongoing process. Our uh, your town leaders want the same thing that residents want. They want a thriving, vibrant community that provides amenities that are attractive to residents and to visitors. And uh, uh, so, things like this, we, we do all do our research independently. Uh, that's something that. Uh, uh, I guess a lot of you, if you've asked me questions or the vice mayor questions or or any of the aldermen, you, you've had some answers uh, based on the research we do. And uh, yes, there will be a traffic study. It's it's ongoing now. Yes, there will be a, a floodplain and, and a land study that will tell us uh, what they feel, what they actually research and, and bring that back to the developer and, and he will pass that on to us. Uh, this this is a uh, something that we uh, that we try to do in a very organized manner. Uh, we've had uh, uh, quite a few meetings on this, uh, as far as through staff developer meetings and uh, and uh, planning commission meetings, and uh, that was something that uh, we do with all all items. And you know, it's this case we went over and above because I've never had a an item that was uh, presented on the agenda uh, that uh, that had uh, had a meeting prior to even going to the conference land use plan steering committee, which there was two meetings there. Um, and uh, that was all, all of our, our meetings are public noticed and um, which is what we do. And uh, so residents that for some reason uh, for the first Seven means they did not be involved, uh, and even after the two steering committee meetings, we did we had very little uh, uh, input uh, from other than the, the people that were on the steering committee, and uh, which was uh, unusual compared to what we had with uh, the McPhee Road and the Watt Road. Uh, but it was very similar to what we the, uh, lack of uh, uh, input from the citizens on the outlet. Uh, Entertainment center or entertainment quarter, um, we had virtually no no input from from that as well. But uh, anyway, that's uh, we've uh, we've went through much as would any other uh, 
subject matter and the town center has been was actually the fourth of the uh, steering committee's projects to look at. Uh, they were based all of them based on the fact that there had to be a reason for us to look at it and with the uh, but, um, uh, area uh, Snyder Road area that was because of top golf I mean they come to us and and we had to look at it to see what needed to be done for that to fit uh, the same with the uh, Watt Road we had uh, property owners out there that wanted to change the uh, zoning on their property uh, to uh, uh, commercial so they could sell it and the residents out there were very uh, involved with uh, they did not want uh, the uh, commercial right up against their subdivisions and you can't blame them uh, they, they asked for a uh, basic transition in between the uh, the commercial property and, and their subdivision of course there would be a buffer as well and any anything that we look at has to have a transition and a buffer and it and I don't matter what piece of property it is that's what we require and uh, and of course when we we done the Watt Road that was again driven by somebody that was uh, potentially looking at putting a, um, a a little strip center out there and that was brought to the residents and uh, we uh, we learned what uh, what they wanted so we we have really uh, what I can say is we we do this a, a certain way and I think it uh, in this case we've pretty well covered it all and uh, at this point uh, I will uh, uh, go to Alderman Burnett if he's available or not I think, uh, our, I think David has a statement that he wanted read in uh, yes sir mayor <clears throat> Alderman Burnett couldn't make it tonight but he did have uh, one statement he wanted me to read in for the record he says currently all of the area designated as mixed use town center district on the land use plan could potentially have high density residential. The proposed language change to the comprehensive land use plan will limit the high density residential impact in this area. It will also require multifamily residential to be part of a mixed use town center development. In other words, someone can't just build multifamily residential in the middle of the mixed use town center district area without a town center concept included. I'm in support of the proposed amendments to the CLUP because it protects our current residential areas as well as puts limits on future high density residential developments in the MUTCD area. Okay, thank you for Alderman Burkett's uh, statement. At this point, uh, I think I'll yield the floor to our town affairgate lawyer, Tom. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, the, I guess the third time's a charm. Um, I've spoken at the last two meetings about um, suggestions by uh, citizens uh, who have made the, made a point of suggesting that somehow the process used by the town in uh, dealing with this comprehensive land use plan amendment was illegal or unlawful or somehow uh, inappropriate. And um, I, I've reviewed the circumstances as I've reported before. I think uh, we are completely uh, handled this in the appropriate way and uh, I feel no different tonight. I would like to address um, one of our citizens who was claiming that we were violating the open meetings law and the public notice law has now shifted uh, the focus from that because there is no violation of, of the open meetings law and now is focused on the language of the land use plan. And I think, I think the I'd like to comment on this particular issue because it illustrates, I think, difficult job uh, the elected officials and the staff of the town have in trying to uh, manage the multiple requests for land use decisions that come into the town. 
this particular uh, land use plan amendment uh, or the land use plan, excuse me, provides the language that you've heard read that when there's a major change in the land use plan, there is a uh, suggestion that there be substantial outreach to the community. Well, of course, we're dealing with adjectives that have relative meaning. Uh, what is a major change or a major upgrade? I can make a pretty sound argument that the changes that are being made here uh, are, are not major. Uh, but let's assume that they are. What does substantial public outreach mean? As I look at what has happened and I look at what the mayor wrote in his article in today's paper, I'd say this has been pretty substantial public outreach. When you look at the history that has gone into this uh, deliberation, uh, I would say there has been maybe more than substantial. Now, I will I will acknowledge that the people who sit in these meetings and deal with the issues probably see it a lot more substantial than the citizens who don't attend the meetings. If you don't attend the meetings and you don't know what has happened in the past, what these elected officials have had to, to go through in order to consider this, you probably wouldn't view it as substantial. But I'm here to tell you that there has been, in my opinion, substantial public outreach. Uh, the irony of this whole discussion is that we've now had a meeting of the Planning Commission where public input was provided, uh, and, and I'm leaving out the preliminary meetings, We've had two meetings where there has been substantial input from the public to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen, which uh, more actually more input than I've ever seen at a meeting, given the the fact that we're reading the the materials. Um, and, and all we're talking about is the amendment to the land use plan. We have a project that is being apparently studied and proposed and developed by one developer that would be on the, the Biddle Farm, that property hadn't even, it's not even zoned yet to provide, to do the project that is being proposed. We've still got to go through multiple layers of study and approvals and plan development and traffic studies and all those things before you even, we don't even have the final plan actually that would need to be studied. So we've got all that input there. Now we find out there's a potential other plan uh, that is being suggested that will also have to be studied and uh, vetted and the property where it's located in zoned yet either. So all of these developments are going to have to go through rezonings, which means they got to go back to the Planning Commission. The Planning Commission has to have a public hearing, uh, and it'll probably have more than one meeting to deal with the rezoning request. It then, whatever its recommendation is, comes to the Board of Mayor and Aldermen, and then those rezonings will have to be um, determined uh, by two readings again. So when I say irony, what I mean is we're at the very beginning of a process, a long process where there's all kinds of public input and all kinds of studies required and all kinds of engineering and the, the floodplain issues are going to be looked at. All of these issues that have been brought up have to be dealt with in the process. And it's a process that is set out in all, all of our regulations that we have to go through in order to get to a final approved project. Many projects along the way don't make it. For one reason or another, they can't be done the way the people want to do them. So, you know, 
everybody, if, if they would just focus on trying to study what's being proposed and provide their input, then, you know, nobody knows what the outcome of this is going to be. Uh, it's going to be, it's, it's really uh, creates, I'm sure, heartburn for the elected officials to have to, to deal with more than one of these projects at once where you have two substantial projects that people are wanting to propose. But what, what I think I want people to understand is that the town doesn't have the luxury of telling people without studying what their proposal is, you can't develop your property the way you want to. Now, that doesn't mean we have to approve or the town has to approve what they propose, obviously. But for for the elected officials to precipitously ignore and not deal with in a serious way proposals that are presented is that's what's going to get the town into a serious lawsuit. The lawsuit about substantial public input is a, is not uh, an issue for me. There's been plenty of input here and there's going to be plenty of input into the future. And I think, again, I'm going to say it one last time. I hope people will quit calling people names and quit suggesting people are misrepresenting things and quit suggesting that people are dishonest and come in and provide your comments like a number of people did tonight about the merits of what is being proposed. That's what we're here to do. And uh, unfortunately, we have some people who have already made up their minds without knowing anything about what's being proposed, what the outcome ought to be. That is arbitrary and capricious. That's what will get the town sued is if it took that approach. What the town has to do is to consider the ration, the rationale of every development and make decisions that are sound in the best interest of the town. Everybody's not going to agree with those decisions. Unfortunately, it would be nice if everybody agreed on everything, but that's not going to happen. The elected officials have the very difficult job of studying all of these facts and all these circumstances, all these plans, and they have to make a judgment at some point along the way as things go. But we're a long way away from that judgment that will result in anything being built. And there's all kinds of opportunity for people to have their input. So let's get off the name calling and get on to the planning. Um, one other point, one complaint was made about not knowing that uh, the meetings were happening. Well, the meetings that the town had, they're all published. The, their notices are published in advance of the meetings. Uh, one of the and, and it's understandable why people maybe don't know about it, don't see it until they read about it in the paper. We, we understand that. But the town can only do what it can do. The old saying, um, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, we, 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 all we can do is advertise the meetings. And, and then if people come and have input, then great, that's what the town has the meetings for and why they're open to the public, why the developer meetings are open to the public, why the steering committee meetings are open to the public. They want people to participate. But when you don't participate and then vehemently criticize and, uh, and are negative about the efforts of people who are operating in good faith to try to lead your town to a better place it just it's just not appropriate so let's let's try to be a little bit more empathetic of the people that are involved in this and and maybe things will go a little bit smoother uh, i'll sign off i think everything's been done appropriately I, I don't have any concerns about any allegation that the process has not been properly handled and uh, and I say this to the people out there that 
that have not made up their minds. I know there's some people that are, they're not going to listen to what I have to say because they've already made up their minds what they think about the process. But uh, I think those of you who are open-minded, you can be uh, sleep well tonight knowing that the town is in good shape as far as this process is concerned. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hale. We appreciate your your efforts on our part. And um, at this point, uh, I do have a motion on the floor that has been seconded and sufficiently covered uh, the discussion. We have also been able to hear the uh, citizens' comment on this item. And so at this point, I'll ask the uh, town recorder to please take a roll call vote on the motion. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Alderman Pinchuk? Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Alderman Poplin? Alderman Poplin, yes. Mayor Williams? Mayor Williams, yes. Let the record show that the ordinance 2020 has been approved on the second reading. Okay, next will be ordinance 20 21. It's an ordinance to the general fund and insurance fund for fiscal year 2020 2021 budget. Passed by ordinance 20-07. Yes, sir. There are no changes um, from the first reading of this ordinance. And the summary is to increase the appropriate expenditures for the general fund by $19,000. That is to um, replace the um, water source heat pump at the community center. And that cost is um, split with the Knox County. Um, the next one is the retirement benefit contribution. It's an increase of $6,000. And that's based on the investment income actuarial assumptions and the plan administrator has advised the town to contribute the six thousand dollars for this fiscal year the motion is to approve ordinance 2021 on second and final reading thank you motion move to approve All All right. 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 Okay. Uh, any uh, resident or questions or comments on this particular uh ordinance no, sir. Okay. Okay. Then we'll move on to discussion. We'll start out with Vice Mayor Pavlin. I have none. Alderman Pinchot. Alderman Pinchot, I pass. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer passed. Okay. Now Burnett is not available, and the mayor has uh, no questions. Uh, I now ask the town recorder for a roll call vote, please. Alderman Pinchot. Yes. Alderman Poplin? Alderman Poplin, yes. Alderman Meyer? Alderman Meyer, yes. Mayor William? Mayor William, yes. Let the record 20 21 has been approved on the second reading. Okay, next will be our four business items. Um, and we'll start off with approval of supplement request from Ross Fowler, PC, at McKee Park. Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Daryl Smith, town engineer. Uh, Allison, is everybody, can everybody hear me okay? Right. Can I take that as? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, this item is approval of Amendment 3, supplement request for additional design services from Ross Fowler uh, at the McPhee Park Phase 3 project. Uh, you'll recall some time ago, the board awarded contract for design services for this project that's currently underway. Uh, at McPhee Park uh, to Ross Fowler based on a fee of a cost of 7.25% of the total construction cost. Uh, that had a total fee of $442,250. Later on, as we were approaching the bid process, uh, the board asked that Ross Fowler increase their scope, uh, expand their scope to include bid alternates so that it would, it would allow some flexibility uh, for the board when awarding the contract. Uh, that increased their scope to a point where the 7.25% 7, 7 of their new estimated construction cost uh, allowed a fee of $559,124. Now this item, uh, as you know, the project is currently underway and uh, this item is request for additional services 
uh, to make some adjustments, really, to what has already been designed. Uh, it's a fairly minor amendment to their contract. Uh, actually, uh, their, the work has already been completed. The work was to uh, add a, an asphalt basketball court uh, to make some changes with walkway, uh, irrigation, uh, spectator seating, tennis shade, and some uh, uh, some f fencing adjustments around the tennis courts. Uh, the biggest item in that, of course, was the design of the asphalt basketball court. Uh, they are requesting an additional $6,900 in fee. That is based on their hourly rates. Now, at the last board meeting, I know there was discussion of this item, and the board asked the staff to go back and take a look at this to see if it might be more appropriate to base their fee on the seven and a quarter percent construction cost. At this point in the game, it's a that that's a little unclear. Uh, the easiest way to do it to compensate them properly and accurately is just based on the hourly rates that are provided in the contract. That's that's a standard way of doing it. It's included in all of our professional services agreements. Uh, that was actually in the original contract that was approved. Uh, all that being said. Uh, as I pointed out, the work has already been completed. Based on their hourly rates, they're entitled to compensation of $6,900. So anyway, all of that being said, staff recommends approval of this Amendment 3 supplement request from Ross Fowler for additional design services with a fee of $6,900. Comment for approval. Thank you. We have a second. Mayor, you're going to have to second. Um, once okay. you start discussion, I'll discuss, but you're going to have to second. No problem. And see, we'll start off with uh, Vice Go ahead. Well, and uh, um, David, just to be for clarity, um, Drew's not on the line, correct? Correct. I think he's trying to get uh, to a place where he can get and add into the meeting, but he's not right now. Okay. Uh, I don't, um, you know, I don't support this project, but be, just for uh, not to have to push this off to another uh, meeting. I will change my vote to yes, just in respect out of uh, that there would be a majority if Drew were here, because I think a 2-2 two -two would make the, the um, project fail, correct? This vote would fail? It would, yes, ma'am. You'd need a majority vote on this to, to for the payment of the work that's been done. That's right. Okay. And that's, so, and that's fine. I just wanted the clarity for you guys for the record. I'm willing to change my vote just to make sure that this continues to proceed, even though I'm not supportive of this project at this point. So just wanted clarity on that. Okay. Uh, I guess we'll go next with uh, Alderman uh, Meyer. Well, I think the vice mayor has demonstrated one of the strengths that she has um, that really moved me to no nominate her for being vice mayor, which is the gift of perception because I'm an absolute no and we'll be voting no against this. Okay, sir, I'll pinch up. I have no further input. Do you want him? I have no further input. I pass. <laughs> okay, do we have Alderman Burnett? <clears throat> the line? Mm, cricket, so not. Uh, well, I pretty well stand by what I said before. I do think since they have already done the work, they do need to uh, I don't think anybody would go into a project. Um, and I'm wondering if we get paid or not. So I, I think we do need to, uh, to go uh, uh, approve this. So. Alderman Burnett on the line, I will go ahead and ask the uh, counter recorder for a roll call vote. 
Alderman Pavlin. Alderman Pavlin, yes. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, no. Alderman Pinchuk. Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Mayor Williams. Uh, Mayor J. Yeah. Uh, let the record show that the request has been approved. Your next will be approval of a lease agreement with Knox County for the office space in Farragut Town Hall. Uh, yes, sir, Mayor. We do have a uh, five-year agreement in front of you tonight to extend the uh, lease agreement with Knox County for the clerk's office and the uh, trustee's office. We've had several years that the clerk has uh, been in our upstairs uh, room, about 1,200 square feet. This would allow that ex uh, lease to extend from November 1st of this year until October 31st of 2025. Um, this is a standard lease agreement we've had with them for several years now. And I know they are taking it to the county commission for approval as well. And uh, staff would recommend approval. Okay. Uh, Move to have, approve the yeah. agreement between the, between the town and Knox County for lease of office space. On the Meyer second. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, was there any questions from the, the residents on this one? No, sir. Uh, no, we'll move on discussion. Uh, I guess uh, I'll have one, have one out of myself. Uh, have we heard from them on, on whether or has it or has it had time to go to the uh, county? Mayor, I think they were trying to get it to the commission as soon as possible. So I'm not sure uh, in talking to the clerk's office, they were trying to get it this month. If they couldn't, they were going to get it on next month. But, okay. Um, but I've talked to the clerk's office and they were okay with the terms as presented. Okay, thank you. We'll um, move on to Alderman Pinchuk then. I pass. Okay, Alderman uh, Meyer. Alderman Meyer, pass. Uh, Vice Mayor Poplin, pass. Do we have Alderman Burnett yet? Yes, yes. Mayor, Alderman Burnett's on. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I have no questions. I pass. Okay. Uh, and I've already said what I need to say. Uh, I now ask the town recorder for a roll call vote, please. Alderman Burnett. Alderman Burnett, yes. Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Alderman Pinchuk. Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Alderman Poplin. Alderman Poplin, yes. Mayor Williams. Ma <clears throat> Mayor Williams, yes. Let the record show that the agreement has been approved as requested. The next will be approved the amendments to the Education Relations Committee Charter. I guess that's me. Um, as you all know, I've been kind of struggling with our Education Relations Committee, but um, uh, with the charter, but we had a really successful meeting, our last meeting. Unfortunately, all the votes we made uh, weren't with a quorum because I don't have representatives for the private schools. And one of the um, high school, um, the high school representative was missing. So um, one of the things that I'm proposing is that until I can understand what the participation is from the private schools, we move them to non-voting members. Um, once uh, I can find some interest and uh, they figure out whether they wanna fit in, then we can reamend the charter and bring them on as voting members or just leave them as non-voting with represent representation so that they can come in and find out. Um, really what we've talked about is our schedules. Fundraising schedules are kind of all over the map this year, as you all well know from COVID. So um, that's one of the changes I'd like to make. The other change I'd like to make is an opportunity for them to designate a representative in their absence. These are all busy moms um, with kids and they're not gonna always make the meetings. Um, a few of them, one of them is a PTO president. Well, two of them are PTO presidents, but the other ones are not. So there's usually some more, uh, there's other individuals serving on the PTO or within the school that, that could be in the know and um, could serve as a representative um, for the meeting so that we're not losing um, you know, momentum or losing an opportunity to have um, any critical votes that need to be made made. So those were the changes that I've proposed and um, 
I'm requesting that you all accept those. Okay, is that a motion? That's my motion. All right, and I'll second. Okay. okay uh, do we have questions on this one? No, sir. None? Okay. Well, start off on this one. You need a quorum uh, for it to work, and, and uh, I think that's ideal to do what you've asked. Uh, you know, with that, I support that. So uh, we'll go on with uh, Alderman Meyer. So the only question I have is Vice Mayor Poplin. Um, so just make sure I understand the situation. Um, Concord Christian School, St. John Newman Catholic School, and Knoxville Christian School have not been responsive to our request for representation. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm struggling to find okay. the contacts that I need. Um, I call or I like I reached out to you because I know you have a child in St. John Newman and I've reached out to Lisa. Lisa gave me the phone number for the PTO president. She never got back to me. Um, Concord okay. Christian, it's the same issue as I, I'm not sure. And of course, with all the other stuff we've been dealing with, I, this has ends up, ended up being on the back burner. So um, at the risk yeah. of having another meeting where I didn't have a quorum, it's not for lack of interest, and I really would like to get them engaged. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, but there, I think uh, probably Kay Well, your contact. Uh, and I've reached out to her, and she hasn't responded. She has not responded. Okay, well, that's the only contact I have. There. Okay, we'll yep. move on then to um, Alderman uh, Pinchot. I think what you've done here is um, is great, uh, Louise. So uh, I'm all for it, and uh, I have no no questions. Yeah, hey, thank you, Alderman Burnett. Yeah, I think uh, I think the changes make a whole lot of sense, and you know I'd love to help out any way I can, maybe on the CCS side to get some mentors because I would love to see those private schools be represented. But you know I don't want it holding up the meeting, so I think the changes make sense. Drew, any help you can give me would be greatly appreciated. Absolutely, I'll be in touch. Okay. Mr. Mayor, this is Alderman Meyer again. Could I, I just have a question based on Alderman Burnett's comments. Can I ask one more question? I'm sorry. Sure, always. Okay. okay, so Louise, would you be, since I've had kids in two of the three schools, would you be open in having a parent, I guess, who happens to be a BOMA member representing the private schools. And the reason being is because I, I believe um, I believe in our public schools absolutely 100%. I also believe and, and agree with school choice. And I believe that those who've chosen a religious um, education, their voices should be heard as well. And so um, I'm just wondering as a member of BOMA, I'm willing to volunteer to represent Concord Christian and St. John Newman. Um, well, that's these representatives. Well, that's and I appreciate that, Alderman Meyer. But here's the issue: I, we are actually what we doing. What we did at our last meeting is what I've been longing for: coordinating our schedules so that we're not stepping on each other's toes, the school's toes, and that includes the our our private schools when it comes to fundraising efforts, when it comes to events that they're holding, and certainly uh, engage with the town to know what the town events are, so that we can have all of our events can be successful. So that's kind of why I've uh, specified who the person needs to be as someone who is in the know with um, beforehand what the schedule is or is in the planning process. Because ideally, once we get this up and going, we're having a meeting in July or August before they have their planning. We're already kind of throwing around dates so that everyone can kind of understand where everyone else is so that all of our schools can be successful in, in um, gathering from our community. Um, so that's that's the only struggle is, uh, will you know what's going on in the schools? Will you know what events are being planned? Will you know what's going on with the students? So if there's opportunities to celebrate something great that's been going on, we can do that. Those that's that's the kind of stuff I'm looking for and I'm looking for on that on that board. Sure, and I would say yes, um, only because we, you know we do live in the 21st century, and it's hard for me to get accustomed to that being a 20th century kind of person. But there are electronic um, um, newsletters that go out from the heads of school on a regular basis. And I'm just wondering, um, 
although I, you know, I appreciate what you're trying to do, and I get wanting a, a, a um, you know, a quorum. I got that. I totally understand it. I kind of what I'm echoing what Dr. or what um, Alderman Burnett said in that there there is a voice to be heard in the private schools, and I hate to to shut them out. And so, is there a way to have a BOMA member, either Drew or myself, be that kind of ex officio person who represents the private schools? because of, of their very disappointing lack of um, interest at this point, and they might need some, um, I think, education maybe from Alderman Burnett and myself on the importance of their participation. Um, and that's, and so I, I, yeah, so, yeah, these are publicly noticed meetings. You are welcome to come and sit in and and figure out who, who might be the person to reach out to. I, I can use all the help I can get. I, I really want this to be... Um, community wide for all of our students. Um, so yeah, this this is it's not an issue of um, I, I just don't have that relationship yet. I have the relationship with the schools because uh, of the public schools because my kids went to the public schools. So it's an issue. It's the issue of ha establishing that relationship. And if you guys have that relationship or you want to attend, and then you can figure out who who that person is, I'm all for it. Just, yeah, come on. And then we can work this, okay. we can rework this okay. charter. It's, you, you see how often I bring the charter to you guys. <laughs> I was going to say, how many times has this been in the agenda? Uh, item? I like it was that. I've, I've amended this okay. thing a hundred times. <laughs> thank, thank you, Madam God, thank you. Thank you. I could support the um, suggested amendments then as, as documented in our packet. Okay, thank you, uh, Alderman Meyer. I, I do think it's important that, uh, that we, uh, ever how we can, I mean, if uh, Alderman Burnett and Alderman Meyer can, can get a, a go-to person uh, in these two schools, then, uh, 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 of course, everybody's welcome to sit on the meetings. And, and I think, uh, uh, I highly recommend that. I, I do that myself, and uh, I have learned a lot about uh, our different uh, committees and how and uh, that i think that's important that we do that so at this point uh, i'll ask the uh, town recorder for a roll call vote please alderman meyer alderman meyer yes alderman pinchuk alderman pinchuk yes alderman pavlin alderman pavlin yes alderman burnett alderman burnett yes mayor william mayor william yes let the record show the amendments have been approved as requested. The next will be approval of dates for the November and December Board of Mayor and Alderman meetings. Yes, sir. In the past, the Board of Mayor and Alderman have chosen to cancel the second meeting in November due to Thanksgiving and the second meeting in December due to Christmas. The scheduled dates for the meetings in November are Thursday, November 12th and 26th, and December meetings are scheduled for the Thursday, December 10th and 24th. The second meeting in both November and December will need to be canceled, and if the need arises, we can always call a special called meeting. So the motion is to cancel the meetings in November 26th and December 24th of 2020. Move to approve. Alderman Meyer, second. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, uh, now, ask the town recorder, is there any questions on this from the residents? No, sir. No, okay. No, Discussion. Uh, we'll go with Alderman Meyer. Alderman Meyer, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. A comment. Um, I don't. Have, I pass. Sorry. Okay. Late night. Alderman. I have no comments. I mean, it's okay, Alderman Burnett. I have no comments. Alderman okay. Pitchock. Okay. I will have a comment on this. I think that. Uh, uh, we all understand, and I think the public understands as well, that uh, if there's something that is pressing, that we can always have a call meeting uh, in between other meetings, and, and that's something that's uh, that we have had in the past, and and we'll continue to do so as needed. Uh, at this point, I'll ask the uh, town recorder for a roll call vote, please. Alderman Pinchuk. Alderman Pinchuk, yes. Alderman Pavlin? Alderman Pavlin, yes. Alderman Burnett? Alderman Burnett, yes. Alderman Meyer? Alderman Meyer, yes. Mayor Williams? Mayor Williams, yes. Let the record show 
has been approved as requested. Next will be the town attorney's report. And I think we've got Tom out of order there as far as uh, where he made his report. I believe he's pretty well covered it unless there's something else he thinks that we need to, to uh, be aware of. I don't have a report, but I would like to say one thing, and that is that you all are you all are to be commended for what a great job you do dealing with very difficult circumstances. And I think uh, I know how difficult it is because of just being involved. But I think the average citizen doesn't really quite understand how difficult it can be and how time consuming it could be. And I wanted to make a motion that you all get a hundred percent raise. Well, Alderman Meyer, second. Yeah. <laughs> I second. <laughs> well, I will not not call for roll call that one because. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Am I on record wanting an increase of doubling zero, whatever two times zero is? I guess that's still zero, right? It's okay. still zero, but I I do want you to know how much I appreciate how hard you work and. What a difficult job you have, and uh, we'll work through these things. Um, I think uh, it's it, sometimes these difficult times are good because they enable us to talk about things that educate the public on things they wouldn't otherwise know about. So I, I'd say that's the sort of silver lining we're dealing with here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and administrator report. Uh, thanks, Mayor. <clears throat> this uh, next Monday, we were actually having a special called meeting of the Board of Mayor and Aldermen to discuss the Virtue Road construction contract. This is an item that has been lingering for a while as we reviewed a water line that, that was along the road, and that's come to a resolution. So we need to have this now so we can hopefully get the contractor out there and. Um, and get started soon. So uh, we do have a special call meeting Monday, October 26th at 2 p.m. Uh, for the Board of Mayor and Alderman to discuss Virtue Road construction. Also next week on Friday, October the 30th is Freaky Friday. It's a lot different this year than we've typically had in the past. We're gonna have a drive-through Freaky Friday event, uh, heading down Jamestown Boulevard, going to the community center, and then uh, driving down Jamestown uh, to the Village Green um, uh, neighborhood entrance. All of that to be said is that it's already kind of sold out, so to speak. It's signed up. Uh, we had registration. We only have so many that we could have in different time slots. And so we've already got all of those filled. Uh, I know all the businesses have already uh, signed up as well. So we're looking for a great event on uh, Friday night. And uh, certainly the Board of Mayor and Alderman will be the, I think, the first one giving out candy there at the community center. So uh, if anybody has any questions, just let me know. But that's all I have to report tonight, Mayor. Okay. Great report. Thanks, David. Yeah. Next will be Citizens Forum. Uh, for the governor's current executive order, we ask that all Farragut citizen comments be emailed to comments at townoffarragut.org, which must along with your name and address be received by 12 p.m. the day of the meeting and be included into the record at that night's meeting. They must also abide by the public forum protocol to be read into the record. And uh, uh, I think uh, we do have one comment, and uh, then I'll have a comment after that. So, All All right, right, yes, sir, we do have one comment. It is Patricia Lee. Says, Good afternoon. I saw while voting that the town of Fairgate is having a meeting of the Board of Merit Alderman in October. I'm asking that you look into a continued delay of the de demolition of a house that burned at 229. Ballastrol Road in Fox Den on October the 2nd of 2019. I've asked the Coast Department to look into it, and she has been given she has been given a citation to appear in court on October 12th, and then that was delayed until November. This house is a hazard. It will especially be be so at Halloween. The whole structure is unsafe if a child were to get inside. Please give please give this consideration to see if there is any way to speed up the demolition process. That's it. Okay, uh, David, would you like to uh, to give us an update on that, please? 
Yes, sir. This item has been to municipal court. It was um, continued until next month. The judge wanted to give the homeowner time to take care of the issues out there. I know that they have been working on that uh, as the as the comment said for, for quite a while now. Uh, we were waiting for that to be adjudicated uh, with the judge before we do anything further. Uh, and that should happen at the next uh, court date in uh, early November. Okay, thank you. Okay, comment is, uh, I do have one thing to comment on concerning the Citizens Forum. Uh, contrary to the rumor that the Citizens Forum, although it's not required by the state of Tennessee law, will continue at this time as we think it is a valuable asset town. It will continue to be the last item on the agenda. The reason it will stay in that agenda spot is real simple. We have both planning commission and meetings and board of mayor and alderman meetings solely for taking care of town business. We have applicants who have business item agenda, which need to be taken care of first prior to citizens request to speak. A lot of times these these particular people that are have that are applicants, they are paying employees to to show up and and to represent them uh, in the uh, meeting, and we'd like for them to get the meeting taken or the, their business taken care of. That can go on, and uh, that would be uh, so. We will continue on with the way we are on that, and that's that's all I had. If there's any other uh, alderman that has anything to uh, to add, yes. Time is approximately eight one, and without objection, October twenty second, twenty twenty, Fairgate Board Mayor Aaron Alderman was now adjourned.